And um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, um, the first people of Australia, and pay my respects to elders past, present, um, and emerging. And um, what we've done today, so I've said a quick check in with Simon and Kelly. We've I've kind of moved the session around a little bit because there's, the, I think I've had some feedback about wanting more time at the end of speakers to be able to reflect, think, talk, debate. Um, and I think the check in has taken up quite a bit of that time. So, what I'm going to do is suggest that we get straight into the content and to, to Simon and Kelly and then leave that time at the end where we kind of get your contribution really, a thought, a question, um, a debate point, um, so that we're hearing your voices in the series as much as we are the speakers. So I hope that works for people that will shop, find out, and you can let us know um, at the end of the session. So Simon, I'll go straight over to you then, you and Kelly. Okay. Thank you. Right, I'm going to sh try and share some slides. So yeah, I'm Simon Duffy. This is we're in Sheffield in England uh, to wearing t-shirts to locators in our in the basement of my house which is also the office of the Centre for Welfare Reform and Citizen Network and by my side is the lovely Kelly Hicks. Um, say hello Kelly. Hi everybody. <laughs> Just try and get Kelly to talk a little bit and uh, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, I mean, all these sessions have been quite philosophical, so I'm just rolling with that. <laughs> Doesn't necessarily soon mean people want it, but I think that's what we've done. We've tried to dig deeper into what we mean by the different ideas that may make up the keys to citizenship. Um, so again, as ever, I've got a few slides. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk through those. And then I've got, Kelly wanted me to just basically ask her questions. So the reason uh, we invited Kelly to be part of this is Kelly is, I don't even, I was going to say you run PFG, but that's not even the right word. Is it run? No. It's a, is a, is a strange verb, isn't it? Yeah, I deal with all the problems. <laughs> Kelly is at the hub of a peer support group called PFG Doncaster, People Focus Group Doncaster. And we're, I think... Well, certainly for me, it's what, one of the places that has taught me the most about what good help really means. Um, but I think that's, that's a whole question. And um, so we're going to try and get Kelly to talk a little bit about what that means and her experiences and how that all evolved. Because for me, it's the, the best example in my lived experience of what good help really means. So... I'm going to start by going through these slides and uh, try not to take too long. I need to share my screen. Uh, I need to take that one. Okay. Okay, good. I think that works. Okay, so. Oh, yeah. So citizenship and and help. I mean, it's funnily enough in the first and second versions of key citizenship um i called this key support which is of course the word that um like professionally um was the improvement on care coming from that kind of world so people talked about care and we said oh no it's not about care it's about support and sometimes i'll give a whole little talk about why support's a better word than care but when i've been working with my friend wendy on the key citizenship and the, the third version that we'll publish hopefully uh, towards the end of this year or early next year. Uh, we, um, so why are we using the word like, I mean, you don't even, the word support, while in a way it's a kind of a natural word, it's not an everyday word. I mean, and the way professionals use it is definitely highly bracketed. And we thought, well, what, what's wrong with the, the word help, uh, which is something that we're all familiar with. Um, and uh, but here I've called it citizenship and good help because I think there is a really interesting question about what good help means. So um, yeah, I'll get into some of this. just through. Oh. Uh, not at the moment. I just I. Can't. That's Katrina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So why do why does the idea of citizenship? need the idea of help or I've said here why does the idea of citizenship need need and it's 
you know, again, one of the funny words in the, in the world that we occupy is this word independence, which is um, what, what aspect of independence do we want? Well, I think, which we've already touched on in the key citizenship, we certainly want to have freedom in the sense that we want to be able to do the things that make sense to us, that re- lead a life of meaning, do the things that really matter to us, the things that are truly our own. But the word independence also has another meaning, which is to not be dependent. Um, um, And that can be interpreted as not needing anybody. Um, And the funny thing is, if you think about not needing anybody, then really what you're talking about is the end of citizenship. So if you imagine somebody like Robinson Crusoe or some, some amazing inventor who can build robots so that every, every one of his or her needs can be uh, met without any human contact, well, then that person simply isn't a citizen. They're simply not connected to any community. They're not recognized as a citizen. If somebody doesn't need us and doesn't need anybody, They really fall out of community altogether. And I think that's so, I think in in our world, we really need to think about the importance of appropriate dependence, appropriate need for each other. Um, So I've got a couple of philosophers. Here's Adam Smith, famous for talking about markets, but I think this is quite interesting. So each individual stands at all times in the need of the cooperation and assistance of great multitudes, while his whole life is scarce sufficient to gain the friendship of a few persons. So there's a couple of things going on here, but one is a really practical thing, which is just worth remembering, isn't it? I mean, uh, why, how can we have this conversation? Well, it's not just because Kate and Bev facilitated it, so we needed them. Um, it, it's all the people who invented the Zoom technology. It's all the people who invented the internet. Everything we do in the modern world depends on the support and interactions of hundreds, if not thousands, of other people. Of course, those those relationships of need and interdependence are not really the same as friendship, um, as Adam Smith defines it. Another, I think, great philosopher is Judith Snow, also a philosopher we've lost. But Judith makes a number of points, but I've tried to summarize in this statement from her. A disability is a special gift because it means that we have to ask for help. So now there's something interesting about disability that Judith is saying here is that it's not that people with disabilities need help and other people don't need help. The reality is we all need help. As soon as you imagine a world where we didn't need help, you've you've just you're just imagining something so primitive or non-existent, we can barely imagine it. But what Judith is saying is that some folk turn up in the world in a way where their needs are so much clearer, more demanding, more obvious. So people just have to ask for help in order to get in critically important things done. And, um, and in a sense, then, you could think of disability as, as a gift to the world because it reminds us of something that's true for everyone, but that somehow we ha- keep having this habit of forgetting. And that's the, the thing that interests me in, in the idea of independence is the way in which we can, we can somehow just forget that we needed other people. Uh, we needed our parents, we needed our friends, we needed our family, we needed the train driver, all those things. We just, it just goes out of our consciousness. And so the gift of disability is it kind of raises in our consciousness the fact of our needs for each other. So in the context of the story of the keys to citizenship, help is also kind of at that critical point. So if you if you followed this whole narrative the idea there's a there is a kind of you can start anywhere with the keys to citizenship but there is a little bit of a logical flow from trying to explore what a meaningful life is for you to trying to get the freedom to live that life to trying to get the resources and the home base to live that life and then trying to identify the right kind of support that will enable you to live 
lead that life. And so in practical terms, when I wrote the keys to citizenship, or if I was doing planning with people or helping families and individuals think about service design, oftentimes what you're trying to do is say, think about the help you need to do the things that you want to do in the context of the community that you're part of and with an eye on the goals that you really have. So there are better and worse ways of getting support in the context of what it is you really want to do. So that then leaves us with this question of, well, what, what is good help? So at one level, I approached this question practically back in the mid nineties with the design of organizations like Inclusion Glasgow. Um, and we, we, we still talk about that as personalized support. And so this, this graphic is really a representation of, um, um, with a friend and who's in Citizen Network called Sam Sly, we did a kind of global survey of organizations that were hoping to provide personalized support um, and these were some of the kind of key themes that came out. So one way of answering the question of what good support is, is, well, good support would be personalized in, in this sense that I think that for people with, particularly with complex needs, complex impairments, um, it's really important that the support is mindful of people's citizenship, that we remember that the goal is citizenship and that we support people on the journey to citizenship. Um, at a practical level, making that support very individualized is often really useful. So um, if, if Helen, for instance, uh, has, uh, she's a young woman with a brain injury, she um, needs support, but it's really important to her that she gets support from people who are of the same age as her, who, she, who are her friends. She didn't want to go to um, spend her life being supported by women who were 20 or 30 years older than her. It, it, it was really undermining her ability to be the person she needed to be. And so we did work to ensure that she recruited the support she needed and that they were the kind of folk that she needed to be with. And in fact, for Helen, those folk were, some of them were from her own family because that actually was comfortable for her. So individualizing support is really important because who the support is and how the support works um, does need to vary individual to individual. Generally, relationships really matter i think i mean i think if you ask people with disabilities why for instance they want direct payments or self-managed funding in australia why they want to take that amount of control um well partly it's so that they can do the things they want to do but often what people will focus on is so that i can be with somebody who i like who i like to spend time with who treats me with respect so those relationships that are generally committed, um, where, there's, where it is much more than just um, a merely a professional person coming in, carrying out tasks, I think that's what people with disabilities are, are reinforcing all the time. It's much more than the tasks. It's, it's the relationship. It's the community that we're creating together in the, in the supportive relationship. I think... Often we found that it's very important that you, good support is creative. Um, it, it looks at problems every which way to try and find out how to find the best solution. It, it evolves over time um, and tackles problems as they occur. And, and it is a partnership. So I think that good support it means that both both parties are bringing something to it. So that, I mean, that's a story about a kind of maybe the way we've evolved at its best, what might have been 20 years ago, care work. And I think some of us have tried very hard to shift that 
into a different framework of personalized support where the person, the family is in control um, and where the relationships are shaped around them. So I think there's an awful lot, a lot of more we need to do about that. But I think there's, that's one aspect of good support. John O'Brien, who was who gave one of the earlier talks on this series, uh, defined good help uh, like this in terms of what he described as five basic tasks. Um, and again, I think you see some of the same themes emerge. So he talks about, you know, it begins by helping people discover their gifts and their interests. It then is about creating opportunities where those gifts and interests can have full life. So in a way, support begins by understanding what it is that people want to do and where that activity, that need makes most sense. So it starts with this focus on the community and then it, it shifts ideally to helping people make connections in that community and then providing assistance where people need assistance and protection where people need protection. So what John has done in this analysis of help is he's shifted the focus onto inclusion. He's saying, so good help has to be inclusive. It has to start with the assumption that people belong in community. And we know that one of the major challenges in providing help is often the help gets in the way of the life that people really need to lead. So I think that in a way that that's a, um, complementary analysis to the the more personalized support autonomy focus thing which says well what has to happen here is it has to be directed by people with disabilities John is saying well also we need to think about how can good help ensure inclusion is at the heart of everything so in the model that Wendy and I developed around the key citizenship that we we talk about dimensions of good help as being built on mutual respect, supporting development, strengthening capacity, connecting to community, and protecting from harm. So that I think that's a way of building on what John's described. I just want to say, now I'm going to, next bit is probably the most um, challenging or philosophical, but it, in a way, it is a way of, taking these ideas maybe one stage further and also building a little bridge to the work that I think Kelly and, and PFG are doing in Doncaster. Um, so this is a slightly long quote, but it is one of my favorite quotes. So forgive me. I read this for the first time in a book of, around um, uh, Jewish history, actually it just, and it just popped out as this kind of, wow. Um, and, and so ever since I've been trying to think about this and reading around uh, this is Jewish theologian, doctor also, an amazing man, Maimonides, um, lived in both Spain and Egypt. Um, this, this little quote comes from a huge book, which is about analyzing aspects of the Bible in great detail and trying to understand what is, what is the key message. Anyway, I'll, I'll read the quote. You can see it here. There are eight degrees of charity. So we might think of eight degrees of helping people. One higher than the other. The highest degree exceeded by none is that of the person who assists a poor Jew. Again, here, Maimonides is not saying charity is about Jews helping Jews. It's just that this is, a, this is written in a book that is for Jews. So it could just be who assists someone who is poor by providing them with a gift or loan, or by accepting them into a business partnership, or by helping him find employment. In a word, putting him where he can dispense with other people's aid. With reference to such aid, it is said, you shall strengthen him, be he a stranger or a settler, he shall live with you. Which means strengthen him in such a manner that his falling into want is prevented. For me, I, I would, if, if Maimonides was here, I'd say, well, actually what you mean is, <laughs> Maimonides, we, we should support people so that they can be citizens. So that actually in their support that they can be um, 
that we treat each other as equals and we treat everybody in that way. You know, be he a stranger or a settler, the immigrant, the person who is different, everybody deserves to be treated as an equal. And we've got to find a way of helping people so that's true. And, I, and again, this may seem kind of quite challenging, but I took the eight degrees of charity a few years ago and I, I rewrote them um, so that it made it clearer the story that Maimonides is telling. And I think this is the story of good help and citizenship. And I think this is why I think what PFG is doing is so interesting. So if you, if you think about this as a ladder from bad help to good or the best help, you're starting at the bottom and working your way up. The worst way of helping someone is to help somebody, but to do with bad grace. In other words, to do it in a, in a miserable fashion where you make the person realize that they should be grateful to you um, and you don't really want to do this. So that's the worst kind of help. I suspect we've all, all done that at some point in our lives, you know, um, maybe with family or friends, but sometimes we do that. Sometimes, you know, we, um, we give help, but we don't really give enough help. Um, uh, my friend Bob Rhodes says, why would you give anybody half a ladder? But I think quite often in life, that's what we do. We give people half a ladder. We, uh, you know, we give them a bit of what they need, but really not what they need. Um, the third thing is you, you wait for people to ask before you give them help. And you might think, well, what's wrong with that? But from Maimonides' point of view, I think what, what's really interesting is, is that that's, a, that's one way in which we allow inequality to come into the equation, isn't it? We, you know, we, we get that, that person has to ask. We make them ask before we can help them. So we, we, we create this condition where the inequality becomes obvious. So we can overcome that by helping somebody before they even have to ask. That's, that's a better form of help because we've made the help much more natural. We've not reinforced the sense of any sense of weakness on the part of the person who needs um, help. Um, so the fifth highest form of charity or of help is helping somebody and you don't know who it is you've helped. So who you've helped, you can't have any false feeling of superiority over that person. And the sixth form is helping somebody and you don't know who helped you. So you can have no false feeling of inferiority in relation to the person who's helped you. Um, and the seventh form of help is help where neither side knows who's given, who's taken. Now, this is a little bit of a, in our context, maybe a little bit of a um, side issue, but I would describe this is no, the seventh form of help is, if you like, the welfare state at its best. You know, that's kind of why we have systems of taxation and funding that, that are meant to really make all of this issue of help go away. So it stops being charity and it just becomes a matter of what your rights are, what your duties are. You don't, you don't imagine yourself as being ever so wonderful because you pay your taxes. You're meant to pay your bloody taxes and you're not meant to feel incredibly grateful that you get a benefit or a service you're entitled to because you're meant to get those things. That's how society is organized. So I think in a way what, what Maimonides is describing as the seventh form of help is really yeah, a good version of the welfare state where, we, where we've eradicated, say, the stigma associated with benefits. And, uh, and that's why people like me are quite excited by the idea of basic income, where everybody would get a guaranteed income and, and nobody would have to uh, uh, apply for benefits at all, in fact. Um, but the eighth form of help is, uh, and the highest form of help is, again, which is just returning to the previous quote from Maimonides, is helping in a way where there's no sense that anything is being given. 
It's just, it's just life in a way. It's getting on with things. I mean, you say if you set up, if you go into business partnership with somebody, that might be helpful to them, but you're doing it because you both want to do something. Um, so the uh, any uh, although there's lots of mutuality and support built into it, there's no sense of charity. So I think for me the thing that um, I mean, having spent a large part of my life both provide organizing and providing personalized support and then trying to organize self-direct support. When I fell out of that world in 2009, after leaving in control in England, I was very fortunate to be picked up by a couple of organizations. One that was Women's Center in Halifax, uh, where I learned an awful lot. And the other was PFG in Doncaster and both of those, but particularly PFG, I think for our purposes, demonstrate a form of peer support or well I think and again it's interesting self-help but it's not me helping myself it's we helping each other um, so I've got a couple of little slides about that just to set Kelly up um, and uh, but if you're interested in this so we've written we've written a, a kind of short what well, book or long, long report about the work of PFG so I mean things have evolved beyond this now I think um, and some of the things that PFG is involved in, in Doncaster, is really bringing people together. A uh, phrase they used at one stage was people being support buddies. But these are all folk really with, well, a whole bunch of different labels. A lot of, the, a lot of folks started off with kind of mental health labels hanging around their necks, but also disabilities, also dif different difficulties people were facing. And they figured out the most important thing was to help each other. It was not actually to get help from the system, but it was to help each other. And there was an awful lot of power in people's ability to help each other, to help each other get stuff done, to help each other get what they're entitled to, to help each other build different relationships into community. Um, and again, I get this is not really the most important thing, but it is pretty striking. All of this exists because of a tiny, tiny investment of resources at the heart of it, which helps Kelly earn a terribly low salary. But there is, there is the work of Kelly at the heart of this and, and then a few others who've come together around Kelly, and Kelly might talk a little bit about that. Uh, and that then generates through the self-help that people um, provide to each other enormous value um, so these are some of my questions for Kelly I think I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna take this stop the screen sharing now so you can actually see Kelly Thank you. <laughs> and um, so we're just gonna dive into this and then and then pass back to Kate to manage the discussion section and the, the feedback is that okay um, so my first question to Kelly is, is asking Kelly to tell a little bit of her story. So Kelly. Okay. Hi, I'm Kelly. I am, I'm a social worker. I, am, I worked for the local authority for about, about 10 years. Um, but during this time, I got really disheartened with what it was to be a social worker. Um, everything was about figures, nothing about relationships. And while I was working in Doncaster, I had a few people on my caseload who'd got some quite serious mental health issues. And I was really excited about personalisation at that time. It worked really well for learning disabilities. Um, so I wanted the same for, for these people who have got a mental health issue. I'd done quite a bit of work with you when I was so, you know, this was going to change things. But the local authority told me that I had to be quiet, that it weren't available for people with mental health issues, that they hadn't set our mental health service up correctly so that people could only ever get health needs met, never the social care needs. So I kept challenging this because that's what social workers do when they said, you know, you've got to stop this now. You know, you can't work for us because it will cost us a lot of money. So just be quiet, just let it go. Um, but I couldn't let it go because it was so unfair to people. So I left the local authority 
and worked with these few people um, to legally challenge the local authority about why they weren't having their rights upheld to have a personal budget. I think in the first month there was about 10 people that, um, that wanted to explore this and wanted to ask for a personal budget. But within, within four months there was sort of 40, 50 people um, and what became like just a, a challenge became an old group of people saying okay then we're doing this what else can we do uh, we realized it was going to be a long challenge in fact it took nearly five years to get those <laughs> legal rights upheld and it's still not brilliant now in Doncaster for people with mental health issues but I think in the middle of it that's what people said is well what what are we going to do to help each other and then I think really that's when the PFG were, were properly born. Um, and people started filling those gaps for each other. So the people that couldn't make it to appointments were getting support of other people who, who could transport them to appointments or going shopping. You know, if they, they were too anxious to go into a supermarket or to say, well, you know, I'm all right with that. Or I can teach you to online shop. It was just incredible what people were offering, cl cleaning people's homes, helping people, um, where social services were involved with childcare proceedings, helping people to become better parents. It was just quite unbelievable what was happening. And I think what people were telling me through this is that there'd always been service users or patients. And when they were part of the PFG, there was a person and there was a person that could, could give something. They weren't just there saying, I have a disability, I need help. It was, well, I might have got a disability, but I'm really good at this, so, so I can help with that. Um, over time, we've got nearly, nearly 500 members across Doncaster now. These are all people that have got, not everyone's got a disability. Some people have got some really complex disabilities. And part of the challenge about it for us is, um, how we explain this to the local authority and the statutory services they love what we do and they know that it works because they they see that people become part of our community and they're not going into hospital anymore or their hospital stays are much shorter then they don't need a personal budget anymore because they're getting help within their own community but measuring this is really difficult because our system set up where there's there's finances available for older people or for people with a learning disability but because we accept everybody in our community they don't know who should be funding us or how they measure it because what what we've got is loads of people saying my life is so much better I've got loads of friends and I'm doing things every day and I feel really useful in my community now and I'm proud to be part of my community they, they don't know how to measure that and that's part of what we're doing together yeah. now and I think I wish I could turn the camera to the center and show you what people are doing because in in the center we've got two paid member of staff myself and somebody else we run 24 hours a day with our online support but this is all done through people that are members They're, we have people that give 40, 50 hours a week, you know, and everything from maintenance, you know, to helping others, to running set. We know we have a football team, we have a band, we we cook a hot meal every day where everybody from the, the community, there, <laughs> where everybody from the community can come. We go to the theatre, we go, we go to the pubs, you know, and Again, this was challenging for the statutory services to understand in the beginning. Um, and as a social worker, I think you remember in the beginning, they said, um, Kelly, you are, you're not acting um, correctly for your code of ethics. You are leading vulnerable people to go out drinking and gambling. Uh, and it was like, well, yeah. yes, we are going drinking and gambling because, you know, this is part of our community and this is what adults do. Uh, I mean, the, the complaints obviously weren't upheld <laughs> because it's adults that have a right and a choice. And, you know, a lot of these people are people that have never been able to access anything in their own community. And they didn't want special places to go because they had a disability. They wanted to be able to access what, what me and you can access around our community. And I think that that's what we've achieved 
is a really, really strong community of people. And we now sit on every single body that in the local authority and the mental health services that make strategic decisions. On every one of those, we have people with mental health issues that sit there being part of that discussion um, and that debate, we, which is magnificent because 10 years ago, they told us they didn't want peer support, you know, that it was crazy, that it could never work, people could never be trusted enough, or how would we manage the risks enough? So I think for me, that's, that's what I feel most proud about, is that it's, it's not only accepted now in Doncaster, but it's really welcomed, you know, everything that they come towards. If they want to see, speak to people, get the real ideas, test things out, they will come to us. And, and it's all been done on very little as well. You know, it, it's born from, per, you know, the values of personalization. But I think it was when people actually got hold of it themselves and said, this is what we're going to do. The answer what you want. To that be. was brilliant. Yeah. Yes. So I didn't have to ask you any other questions. I've got some, I just got a few, I, I rather randomly, I should have done this better. Oh, I'll just share these little photographs quickly. Um, just to give you a little flavour. So this is the football team. Uh, you see that? And then there, this is Great British Care Awards, where you won, what was the... You w putting People First, it was a... The Putting yeah. People First Award. And this is a picture at Christmas. So anyway, that's only, that doesn't do justice to it all, but gives you a little bit of a flavour. Well, we have at least, I mean, there is a, probably 100 people that would happily sit in front of this camera telling you what it means to them and how their life has changed from it. And I mean, Kate, if you want that one day, definitely we'll set it. Now I know where it works. <laughs> I could set it yeah, up and tell you. That would be great. That's us, I think. For, uh, we can respond to questions and things, but... Okay, thank you. So, shall we just start with a kind of open round then? So, where's that taken you thinking? Steve, where's your you? Where's your thoughts? Hi, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm. This, this is really useful stuff because I'm actually going to see a friend this afternoon who. Um, has uh, um, had some difficulties uh, uh, around his support, not from his point of view, but from the point of view of perhaps the people who fund it and th things like that, because um, he uh, chooses the kind of people, as we've talked about, who are kind of most like him and most uh, comfortable with the things he wants to do. And that uh, sometimes means that uh, some of the uh, care functions that um, the um, sponsors want to see accomplished don't always get done in that way. So we're going to have to do some work on trying to balance some of those uh, different needs. But uh, the, the context you've given me today is <laughs> this morning will be extremely helpful for this afternoon. <laughs> okay, cheers, Steve. Anybody else? Katrina, where's it taking your thinking? I can't wait until we uh, look at this model that we've just seen for our social isolation stuff in Aviva. Just quite yeah. great. Yep. It sounds fantastic. Sorry, I came in a little bit late, so I probably haven't got everything, but I'll go and review the start of this. But this is absolutely the right way, I think, to be supporting and yeah. promoting people. Absolutely. Kelly, can I ask you a question? So... One of the challenges that I think we have struggled with over the years, anyway, has been the kind of idea that, you know, like a, a day centre almost, where people are going to a place where they, 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 the access to that place is dependent on their label. And we've definitely, I know within Avivo, our organisation, we've had many debates about craft clubs, um, I don't know, you name it, kind of special clubs, right? The, the people are struggling to connect with their communities, so we create something artificial for people to come to, right? So, so I suppose I'm really curious about PFG and what, so you describe it, 
not at all in that way. And I'm, I suppose I'm trying to understand or figure out, and maybe I'm just analysing it too much, what's different? Because you, if you've been a social worker, you'll have been around the, the tracks. You'll have seen some of the day centre kind of stuff that is on offer for people, which often is really poor. What do you think is the difference with PFG and those kind of models? Um, I think the difference is, I mean, I, we were very clear we didn't want a day centre. And in the beginning, for the first two years, we didn't have a base. We used to meet um, park benches, churches, um, anywhere that we could, pubs, clubs. But I think it was really important for us to have a base as well. We've had the wellness centre for about seven years now. Um, and it's, um, it's a local authority building in the middle of one of the most deprived areas in Doncaster. Um, it, it's not a lot to look at, but it, it was really important for people to have this space so that some people can come and just have, have a cup of tea if they want uh, and just a chat. And there's no criteria for walking in that door. Anybody can, which I think is one of the first things is that there's no referral. Everybody rings up and says, how do I refer somebody there? And it's like, you don't. The part of, the part of Doncaster, just come, just, just come. I think not having because it's called the wellness center as well and it's about it being for everybody whereas in you know what we did traditionally is have little special clubs for for women that have got fibromyalgia or if you've got an hiv diagnosis or something so i think it's really important that it's it's open to everybody and that, that's children and adults that come as well with a range of needs and i think the wellness centre as well, we really drill it in when people come in that this is not about just coming for help here. You, you're expected to give something back as well. This is not charity. This is, this is part of it. If you want to be part of it, you get stuck in as well. And that's from people making cups of tea to helping with the dinner. If somebody's good at crocheting, then we'll say, you know, there's seven other ladies here that want to learn, and men, <laughs> that want to learn how to crochet. So that, that can be your gift back. So people are running the sessions themselves, which I think is important. You know, there's no special teacher up there unless people have asked for something where we need some, to buy in a special skill. So we can never really plan because we never know what's walking in the door. You know, somebody might walk in who's fabulous at photography. So then we, we're quite flexible and we can shift things quickly so that we can then run photography sessions for people. So things change a lot. And I think with the building as well, we, we never really put any money into the building and, and it works for us because everybody, all the members are always out there and we scavenge from everywhere. You know, all the furniture, people are expecting, the members paint the building, clean the building. This last weekend we've just had a new carpet laid, it's been painted all the way through. Next week um, we're doing the garden area, everybody, and it's that people feel like it belongs to them it does belong to them do you know and they protect it themselves you know it's i think we've only ever in seven years i think i've only ever had one theft from the building and you know it was just a small small amount of money you know people know that they'd be stealing off friends if, if they took something from the building that you know that they didn't ask because people will give it anyway they don't need to take things and there's that feeling of pride they, it's theirs you mean you haven't given them a day center you know they've built their own second home really in the community yeah, yeah. fantastic it's, thank it's you not a, it's not a service where the where it's defined by a them and that the people coming through the door are needy people who you've got to somehow accommodate and then that that, that brings in all the questions doesn't it what's our criteria what are we doing Who's this for? No, the people are the are the service. <laughs> so when they come through the door, they might come through with a whole bunch of problems, but they come through with gifts. I mean, yeah, and they're anyway. That's my perception. It's it's well, it's not a service yeah. in that sense. And that's the big change when when people walk in the door. When new people come in the door, they they do come as a service user or a patient, and they start reeling off all of their problems, and it, it it's like a very vulnerable person who's very new who expects you to give them this and that you know and you see the process come and and it's almost like um if, if there's a lot of new people at once it's almost a competition about who's got 
the biggest disability? Who's got the most workers? Who's this? You know, and it's, and you think, how, why are you thinking like this? But they think that they have to do that to get a service because that's how we give things in England. But then three or four months down the line, the same people are walking in and, and they're not service users anymore. You know, they're not telling everybody about how poorly they are. They're saying how well they are. You know, look, I've done this. I've done that. You know, I'm planning this. And that change is just incredible. And you see it the second that it happens in people. Fabulous. Thank you. Jules, where's where's it taken your thinking? Uh, Thinking a lot about, you know, you were saying we we try and set up these things for people. But, I mean, we just need to get away from that, don't we? Because here we have this thing for you. But that's a really obvious gift or or form of help. So the idea that, you know, what have you got to bring to me, almost? It's flipping that on its head, isn't it? I love it, you know, seeing people as um, having something to give instead of always viewing them as recipients of what we have. Awesome. Gosh, thanks, Jules. Jackie, Bev? Jacqueline, Bev? Jacqueline? Oh, Jacqueline, you're, um, it looks like you're, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Bev, do you want to, ah, Jack, Jacqueline, is that you? Can yes. You hear me? Oh, okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what I'm thinking, but just that concept of, um, you know, that mutual exchange uh, centred around community has just made me think about the concept that um, of the, you know, the Facebook buy nothing idea, where in your local community you have those Facebook pages where you, put things that you, you know, don't need or that you do need and your neighbours provide those, you know, items to you and um, people put on and things they don't want and they take things that they do want and it's about sharing things. Can you lend me a a, um, costume for a party on the weekend? And it's about the community supporting each other in whatever it is that they need. And when you were talking, when um, Kelly was talking before about that idea about coming in to somewhere and thinking that it's going to be a taking and yet it's actually a giving and it's an exchange and going back to the independence idea but really taking that as an interdependence idea and how from within our own, the service that I work in, really um, harnessing all the skills of everyone who we support to actually help each other as a starting point to help to go and beyond that. Anyway, so nothing really, it's just triggered some ideas for me, but nothing specific. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, Jacqueline. Bev, you got any thoughts? Yes, I do have some thoughts. Um, <laughs> I um sorry, I've been having difficulty with the laptop. So pardon me for the beginning part of this call, which is a bit disruptive to everyone. Um, I'm really, really um, particularly interested in the way Simon has redesigned the eight steps in the ladder. And um, what actually caught my attention the most is um, about the seventh the seventh step in the ladder, which um, was about being private, about giving. And um, in the Jewish religion, it's called a mitzvah, to be able to fill a deed without expecting anything in return and without talking about it is the best way of giving anybody could ever, ever um, actually do. And um, I'm gonna go and read, the steps, um, Simon, uh, in the other form, and uh, really give that some thought. So thank you for that. If you if you ever wanted to write something down or share it back, Bev, on the basis of that, I I, I found that the most um, 
wonderful thing to discover kind of intellectually. And I think that one of the things that just generalizing a little bit, um, but I think it is interesting in the, in the Western tradition of help. So these words like charity and help and, um, it's very unexamined. So what really struck me was that here was Maimonides with a really thoughtful analysis and which is, as you say, root, it's rooted in the Jewish faith and, and, and there, are, there are all sorts of different aspects to it. Um, but in, in whatever form, whatever's happened in the, in the, movement of that wisdom through Christianity and then into the kind of general, I don't know, Western ethos, we stopped paying attention to um, the detail of good help. I think it's really, yeah, like it's, once you think about it, it's really like, it, it, it's a big deal to not think about what help is. Does that make sense? It's like, yeah. it's a big deal for a society that says help's really important and has a welfare state and, and has had charitable functions and services for hundreds of years to simply not really have very clear narrative about what good help looks like, what bad help looks like, what the distinguishing features are. And that, that's not to say that this isn't something that we can... Um, that we might not be still learning about or that, you know, that the truth is ever captured at one point in time. But what really strikes me is that just how, um, how dull we all are. <laughs> we, we don't really, we don't really have a kind of in-depth conversation about this sort of stuff and explore it. And I, I do think Maimonides is, there is a, there is a kind of Christian tradition which builds on, I mean, of course, Christ himself uses this same wisdom i mean it's in the, your left hand shall not know what your right hand does if anybody's familiar with the new testament i mean it's it's the same jewish wisdom but then it's never really been explored in much depth certainly in kind of the 20th century um you know the, there's all sorts of conversations about redistribution and social services uh, being good things without any exploration of but how? How do you do it right? How do you do it in a way that grows the dignity of the whole community? Um, that's what I think is, yeah, it's a really strange gap in, in, in Western conversations. I, I mean, I don't know what the, I know very little about you know, Asian philosophy and, and other traditions, so there may be more wealth to uncover, but it is a strange thing. So I'm glad that 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 struck a chord anyway, because it did for me, Bev, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Sam. And, you know, I'm just thinking now, you know, really, there is no right way to do a wrong thing. <laughs> and um, I just, yeah, just listening to you talk and, you know, when people expect help, generally, they're not going to get it. It's just the art of giving without expecting and you'll receive it. I might be getting a bit too philosophical now. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll let else. so I, I, I have a, a kind of question or follow on for, for Kelly. So one of the things that um, I, I, I don't know, we've not talked about this too much, but I think one of the things that's interesting about PFG and this whole challenge is um, this isn't, the purest form of self-help, I suppose, is something that, that would be mutual interdependence and there would be no Kelly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when I look, um, and that isn't a criticism of Kelly, because I, I think Kelly, Kelly was, I will say this in it, just to embarrass her, but she was Adult Social Worker of the Year in 2011, Many wasn't years it? ago now. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but the... But this is for a reason. What Kelly did is, is amazing social work. One of the things I noticed when I was with the group back at the beginning was the way Kelly never said, what can I do for you? She would turn everything into, what can we do? What can we do? And I mean, in a way, that's just the purest form of social work. Um, but there is that sense in which... Um, 
there is a kind of there is a little hub to this so it's not a kind of just free floating self help group it, and there are there are the things that you get involved in sometimes uh, you've told the story in a very positive way mm -hmm. but you're dealing sometimes with people who have taken drug overdoses and died you folk who um commit suicide or are very close to committing suicide people in appalling situations of abuse deprivation poverty you know so it's it's there is a kind of steely core at the heart of this it's more than just you but your your role becomes very important and i think one of the challenges so there's something very special going on there i'm not saying it can't be replicated but it is pretty special um and it's also something to do with uh, and i think this is one of the challenge kate for your question how it's very difficult for services with the power that they have to reposition themselves in the way kelly did right so kelly left social services to make this happen and when this story began it was also a story of a woman who'd left behind all the security um, of a job and, and professional systems and just turning up in the community asking the question can I help what can we do you know really you didn't have any formal status did you when we first met you were you were kind of camping out in that weird office space <laughs> um, yeah. you know it, so I don't know I don't know what I'm saying really but I think there are conditions to this which which we we've only just begun to touch really kate we yeah. don't think we really know yeah i think it's really interesting that this the stuff about um how organizations because you see lots of organizations attempt to um support peer support um whatever in whatever guise that might look like but i i don't know whether it is the power i don't know what it is but i also see them really destroy it um so it's kind of with the, with the best of intentions, but something happens to it, the, the system or the service has to control um, that I think, um, yeah, like I was, I was kind of inwardly laughing, but also groaning when you were saying the local authority can't understand what we are and, and what funding we should get. And because we just know that's the world that we live in, isn't it? It's kind of like, well, are you that or are you that? Um, and I can see how you can see how organizations shape themselves around what funders want, you know, and what funders say are important, not necessarily what people want. Like I love Bob Rhodes um, analogy, which you give somebody a half a ladder. And I think it, it's brilliant because I think we do it every day, you know, based on what funders say is OK. So you, you can have this money, but, but we know you live in poverty, but don't spend it on any kind of personal food items toilet roll you know stuff but you can spend it on six hours of support work i mean you can eat but you know make sure you buy a support worker i mean it's just it's just crazy but but that kind of sense of we give people half a ladder yeah really resonated um the other thing that i, I just want to ask you about is the, it, it, one of the things that was sparking for me was about the the key ring organization so carl paul who um was a mentor to me years ago, friend of Simon's, set up an organization called Keyring, and you can go and have a look on their website. Um, I think there were some versions of Keyring in Australia that, that kind of tried to set up. And, Key, and Simon, correct me if I'm wrong, but Keyring was a model where people um, who required support to live in their own place kind of got a property in, within walking distance of each other. And in that kind of neighborhood, if you like, or in that suburb, they would recruit somebody who acted like a kind of facilitator, but they lived in the, in the suburb, they lived in the neighborhood. And their role was to support the key ring members, to support each other. So to help people live in their own home, but, but the deal was to be part of a key ring network, you had to help other people in the network. And I always remember doing some um, work with Carl around, um, the key ring networks that were in London and some people who'd lived in institutions who had loads of support were living with very very little support very vulnerable people and their support relied on these other members of the key ring network and overwhelmingly there were some 
lots of good stuff happened to people as well who were part of Keyring members. But overwhelmingly, if you talk to them about what was good about Keyring, it was the fact that they helped somebody else. I never met anybody that said, Keyring's brilliant because it lets me live in my own home. Everybody would say, Keyring's great because I help Bob and he can't do his shopping. Or I help her because she doesn't know her money. Or it was all about that sense of giving. And um, I suppose it makes me think about support providers and how the expectation just isn't there. You know, if I go back to John's talk about what we've done is just flipped you used to be the boss, now I'm the boss. That kind of consumerist perspective that what we're doing is just serving um, and not necessarily, uh, well, I don't think we talk at all about expectation or contributing back, which is just so empty. You know, when you listen to PFG's experience, it's just an empty transaction, I think. Um, and then the other bit really briefly is about our colleagues. So there's a woman called Carol Sanford who's doing lots, done lots of work in organizational development. And she talks a lot about um, the notion of job descriptions. So if I think about so an organization like Aviva, we have support workers who have a job description, this is what you're supposed to do. And how job descriptions just kill any contribution that you want to make you know if you're good at crochet where do you give that if you it's almost like no no no, we don't want that personal flavor we want a kind of carbon copy so yes it's making me think a lot about not just for the people that we we work with or we serve it is also our colleagues and how they contribute um so i don't know if anybody's got any ideas about that because i just think it takes it much wider No, I was just thinking what you, what you were saying there about you know, the people that work for you as well, because I think that that's what's, what's different at PFG as well, because a lot of the members will say that they work there, you know, that that's their job, being a peer supporter. And it's one of the first things we ask is what, what, people, what people are good at. You know, sometimes people can't tell us. They don't even know what they're good at anymore, you know, because they're so useful. It'd be brilliant to see the workers as well because we get a lot of personal assistance bringing people for the first couple of times and we make sure they get involved as well you know they're not just going to sit there you know watching us you know do all the chatting and stuff but some of the PAs come in and say it's like the best part of their week because they can come in and they can they can do some cooking and things as well and share it's part of them and I think as a social worker as well, that's what I found hard in the local authority, that I couldn't be Kelly. They had this really strict set of rules about what I was supposed to be. And for me, we're, we're at odds with what social work is. You know, we, we should be giving some of ourselves as well. You know, why should you tell me everything so personal and deep about yourself? But I don't, I don't share anything. I think the one, the one of the things that struck me about when Carl invented Keyring and he would... I, I kind of knew him right at the beginning of that journey, actually. Um, I remember him talking about how it was an obligation on tenants to provide help. And I remember how uncomfortable that made me feel in the early days. And, and but when I came back to Carl around it, I mean, he, you know, he would come back to, no, this is really critical because it, it, it lifts everybody up and it changes the culture. And if key ring networks don't work, it's because they don't create that sense of duty and responsibility. They don't, they don't create a framework that does lift people up. They slip into you know, the support worker running around doing things for people. Um, and so being really upfront about that, I think was a really important aspect of key ring, even though, but it does challenge the whole nature of a service because we're the nice people doing nice things for the poor people is written into the DNA of, I would say, 99% of social services. They might not use that language, but really that's, that's the organizing principle. And, and it slips into very quickly a very disempowering model, which curiously disempowers everybody. I mean, it disempowers people with disabilities or mental health problems or anybody's at the end, but it disempowers all the people in that chain of command because if, if, if the people at the bottom of it and the weak people, the powerless people, the not smart people, then the people directly supporting them are only a little bit smarter. <laughs> and the people, because it, it reinforces that idea that all the cleverness, all the brilliance, all the, everything goes up and then all the systems have to come down 
the job descriptions, the contracts, the power, the regulations. It's bollocks. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolute bollocks. Um, sorry, that's a really technical term, isn't it? But, it, you know, it, it's, it's crazy. So philosophical. When you look at it. So philosophical of you. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it is kind of crazy when you look at, like, we have, like, regulators that spend nearly, I mean, like, half a billion pounds goes on regulators doing things that don't make any sense. They don't even, they don't even catch people doing awful things. <laughs> <laughs> but they just reinforce a kind of power, a system that, you know, these are the poor, vulnerable people and you're the potential abuser. And if you dance in this way and jump through this hoop in some way, we kind of mysteriously believe based on no evidence at all <laughs> that things will be better for people. And it actually just seems to me it's a very crude operation of, of power and control um, that, that leads to people at the top of the system earning salaries that approach 200,000 a year and the bottom people living in extreme poverty. And, and if we're not careful, we all become a little bit complicit with this craziness. Sorry, a rant over. No, that's um, fair enough. You are the helper and uh, you are the person being helped. I am the person helping you, and thus the unequal, unequal relationship continues. Okay. So, what time is it? So, we've got 15 minutes. So, <laughs> what was that, Simon? I was asking Kelly if she wanted a rant, and she said it's okay, she's not a ranter. <laughs> <laughs> you may have to provoke her some more. Provoke us some more. It would be really good if um, I, I know I know some of the people on the call quite well, so Katrina and Jules and Bev. It would be great if we could have some conversation with PFG members, um, wouldn't it? Like it'd be really good because, like Katrina says, we're looking at ways to. We know that lots of people that we work with are incredibly lonely. Um, so yeah, we've been thinking about loneliness for a while and. Um, what that could look like, I think, or what we, what could, what's our, what, what could we do in that space? I think. Katrina. Well, yeah. Sorry, Simon. I was just wondering. Uh, wouldn't it be lovely for Kelly to be our second keynote speaker at our Vivo conference? Oh yeah, here in Australia. Yeah. Do you want to go to Australia? <laughs> I've been. I've been before. Yeah, yeah. So she can do it. Thank oh, you. we'll have to think she about that. Speak, isn't she? Yeah. She, yeah. She's good. She tells herself she's not, but she's a very good uh, speaker. Yeah. Uh, she, she, yeah. We have some amazing members at Centre, though. Oh, every, every year we do a, like a, a celebration of what we've achieved that year. And it's uh, last year was people telling their stories, weren't it? And there were people up on the stage that had initially walked into our centre just in a corner, you know, and didn't want to speak, but they were on that stage and they were telling their histories of abuse, rape, drug misuse, you know, the times in hospital and there's never a, a dry eyes are in that room. They're absolutely, you know, I'm sat crying and I know their stories, but to see them get up and, and they love telling that, their story, they know that it's, it's powerful now, you know, before it were there. It, it was what was wrong with them, you know, now it's powerful and, you know, we, we go all over, but I, I, they'd love to be able to do this and, and tell you, there'd be some really great speakers that you'd just get so much more from. Fabulous. Sounds like, the next, sounds like the next series of this is starting to shape up then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody got anything that you want to, we've got 10 minutes, so I'm just, I just want to make sure that you've got the space if you want to ask any questions, if it relates to this topic, any others. Um, yeah, anybody got anything? You have, Simon. Steve, well, I re Steve yeah. has, Steve has. Right, Steve first. Okay, yeah, I found, found today really, really helpful. And yet at the same time, um, left quite concerned really because um, I, I think here in the UK it isn't just um, government agencies 
that kind of get stuck in the rut of we only do this and we only do that. What I also see is in the voluntary sector, so many agencies who say, well, we only do this or we only do that. We social, we social prescribe or we provide things for babies. Or, um, and, and so there is kind of a sense of not many agencies that say all of me loves all of you. <laughs> Um, and also, in that kind of sense, I actually kind of wondered whether um, Simon, you know, um, on the ladder, whether seven or an eight are in the right order, because at least with um, seven, yes, unfortunately, you get to know <laughs> who's, who the giver is, but the giver can open their door fully, whereas I think all too often in eight, in the kind of privacy of charity giving, you give the money, the charity deals with it, but often those charities are actually kind of quite segmented, like we only do this, we only do one part of dementia, we only do that, we only do, do that. So, yeah, it, it, do, we, do we each need to reshape that ladder in, in the wor world or community that we're in? So, yeah, have a look at the ladder, because I think the kind of charity that, like, the voluntary sector provides would be down at three and four. Exactly. Yes. Um, so, so, yeah. And some so, churches. Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah. So, well, you know, I think, I, think, I think the kind of voluntary sector charity, whether it be food bank or whether it be a social yeah. service funded organization, is a very low level of charity. It doesn't yeah. even get to seven or eight. Yeah, um, and there is a, there are. I think there's an interesting discussion about to have what 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 perfection would look like, but yes. the reality of most social services is way down the ladder. Um, I, I, and so I do think that's why we need to have this conversation about what yeah. good help looks like, and I think we need to be much tougher. Um, and the voluntary sector, which I guess you know the social end, whatever we're in, mm. many of us um, needs to be much more honest. The Archbishop William Temple, who was actually the guy who invented the term welfare state in the 1930s, um, talked about the blood money of charity. He said, why should anybody depend on the blood money of charity? And, that, and that's the difference between a really good welfare state and what we've got. Yeah. Because it's about rights, duties as citizens. Yeah and not about these kind of acts of charity. And I think most of the work we're all involved in is still somewhere in that charity zone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the thing I wanted to add into the equation, and it goes a little bit back to a point Kate made earlier, but it, I was remind, I should have maybe put it in the slides, but uh, Kelly and the group asked me to come and do a little bit of work with them way, what about? 2015 I think it was about five years four or five years ago um, because there was there was a little bit of funding to talk about user-led organizations so this was in a way that there was a tiny bit of funding and this part of the system that said oh you're kind of a user-led organization maybe you could write some guidance about funding user-led organizations so there is this kind of quest this is part of this challenge about what what is PFG and how, how would you legitimize the community's ongoing support for it? And um, anyway, cutting a long story short, we, what struck me was how even PFG was forcing itself into the straitjacket of a model that had been defined by the Department of Health about what a user-led organization was. And at a certain point, we just looked each other in the eyes and thought, this is crazy. Because we didn't fit it at all. You, you, didn't fit, you didn't fit the definition of a user-led organization, and yet you've never met a more user-led organization. I certainly haven't, you know, really. And, and so the, the report we wrote was called Whose Community Is It Anyway? And I think one of the questions, you know, going back to this question, Kate, of like, well, what is the what are these services, or how should they be redefined, or how should we how should we at Vivo change how we work so that we can liberate these things? I think one of the useful questions is to start, well, who is the community? You know, the question might be, what is there, what are the points of leadership or action in this community anyway? 
that we can get behind or underneath or support so that we're not the ones who come in and say, ah, you know, we, we, we've listened to Kelly and we're now going to be the ones who come in and do brilliant peer support. I think already you set, you set off down the wrong road when you get the state trying to define a model. This is the PFG model. <laughs> I think we have to start keep asking ourselves, what's going on here? Where, what is this community and how can we, how can we, I suppose this is the kind of asset based community development way of thinking, isn't it? But what is in this community uh, that we can support or get behind? Um, make stronger, make more effective. I think we have to start approaching some of these things, just as John O'Brien said, really, from the perspective of how is, what is this community? What, what gifts do we have that we can share in this community? And it's the way that they give you money as well. You know what you were saying about um, charities becoming, we've had two contracts with the local authority that were the worst, there were, one of them was for hundred thousand pounds the most money we've ever had but it was the worst mistake that we ever did was to take that contract because it changed entirely how we worked because we had to do all their measures but one of his other successes is this year we've been funded for, for the ccg and it's literally a one-page piece of funding that basically says carry on doing what you're doing which is massive for us yeah, because they yeah. now recognize we need the freedom and flexibility and we create a lot more when they're not trying to tie us into those little boxes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, shall we do, we're, we're at the end of time, so um, shall we do a quick check out, just as a kind of bit of feedback for Simon and Kelly. Kelly, who's not a great presenter, who we're all totally inspired by, who's been brilliant. Um, is that okay? So just to keep us kind of going, I'll call on people if that's all right. Um, so I'll start with Jules. Well, I guess, um, thank you so much, Kelly. I'm a bit inspired. Um, I'm studying social work at the moment and I'm gonna remember what can we do um, rather than what can I do for you. And I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, what can we get behind and support rather than what, what can we start? What's already going that that needs a, a little bit of help, good help. Fabulous, thanks Jules. Katrina? That was absolutely brilliant. That uh, is so inspiring, Kelly, and I think you guys absolutely have the model down pat. And I'm really excited to see where at us as an organisation are probably going to take some of your wisdom and make some changes over here. And I'm going to go and look at this as soon as it's up because I missed the first bit. And um, yeah, fantastic. I'm loving this series. It's really, really uh, making me think, challenging me, but also reminding me that some of the stuff I do is actually right, uh, even though it's not always seen that way. So thank you. Yep. Thanks, Katrina. Jacqueline? Sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I guess for me, the big thing is working out how we can celebrate inter inter our interdependence as people and how we can, um, you know, bring more to each other, other's lives by that interdependence and giving people the opportunity, as you were saying before, and it goes back to purpose and all those things, you know, all the things we love and we're good at how can we use those to help other people and um, and you know getting back to the I suppose the center of everything sharing our gifts and that as as an indicator of our independence our interdependence I suppose but it's got me thinking but I haven't got any ideas yet about how we can progress that and bring about some some meaningful change but thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, Jacqueline. Steve? You're muted, Steve? Then not anymore. <laughs> okay, yeah, really, really useful session today. Um, each, each time, really, 
just picking up that bit more. And certainly for me, who's doing a little bit more on my own and a, and a little bit less with organizations, looking at those opportunities to actually move up the ladder a bit, um, to, 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 to be asking, is this really uh, what will make the difference for the, the, the person who's, who's wanting to work with me in terms of how, how, how can they be in control of their own life um, and, uh, and how is this more of them further up the ladder and less of me further down the ladder? <laughs> so, yeah, really helpful. Fabulous. Thanks, Steve. Beth? So, um, I'd like to end off by really acknowledging both Simon and Kelly. And Kelly, I'd like to say to you that you are an absolutely amazing speaker. Never be shy to share your views with anybody because you are just awesome. And thanks so much for a brilliant session. It's really uplifted me today. Thank you. Thanks, Bev. So Simon and Kelly, you've got the final words. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and as I'm, I'm just pleased to give uh, a bit more space for, Ke for people to hear from Kelly, because I do think I, I've learned so much from Kelly and from the whole group and what they're doing. So it's really nice to be able to share that a bit. And, and let's definitely arrange to have the uh, camera at uh, the Wellness Centre. Definitely. Right. Okay, fabulous. Right. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Right. Bye. Bye.